Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs> This man applied for a job at 10 years old after seeing the Jungle Book with Disney. They told him there were no openings, but 13 years later, he ended up working for the mouse. D23 is coming up shortly, but we'll be getting to that in a little bit. Andreas Deja, how are you today? I'm doing good. How about yourself? Listen, man, I get to talk to one of the Disney Nine. I've, you know, I know, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dave Bosser. I know uh, Don Hahn. I get to talk to you. So, like, it's a great pleasure to talk to people that, is set, well, you especially, who's really the king of the Disney villain designs. I mean, Gaston, Jafar, and so on. So, congratulations on the career that you've had. Yeah, 30 years. How about that, huh? Yeah. Um, it was a great run. And, uh, yeah, you mentioned some of those characters I've done, uh, those villains, uh, one, one after the other for a while. And then uh, it was after Scar. Actually, the offers kept on coming because for Hercules, they offered me Hades, you know, the villain again. And I said, well, if I do have a choice here, maybe just maybe I should do a different type of character so I don't end up repeating myself with the same kind of concepts, you know, and similar acting and all that. So they said, OK, so instead of Hades on Hercules, I ended up doing um, the title character, uh, Hercules. Yeah. Well, you've done something right in this illustrious career of yours. You know, Polish immigrant to the United States, uh, living the ultimate American dream, you know, where you didn't have to become an engineer or an architect or a pharmacist or any other immigrant career that they always force upon first generation or immigrants and first generation. So you got to live the dream. Um, but today we're going to be talking about Mushka first, you know, which is the new animated lullaby that you've been working on. Yeah, so this is an, uh, uh, it's not really a short film. It's what they used to call a featurette, almost half an hour. So it's a sizable short film, if you want. And uh, yeah, I've been working on that for quite a few years. And um, today uh, we are just happy to post a music video because we were lucky to uh, have a fantastic singer who, who sings this lullaby. Her name is Holly Sedios. And it was composed by none other than the incredible Richard Sherman, you know, half of the Sherman brothers. People probably remember his name uh, from movies like The Jungle Book, Mary Poppins, The Aristocats, even The Sword and the Stone. And then he also, the Sherman brothers composed songs for the theme parks, most notably the uh, It's a Small World ride. So yeah, just, just stop here for just a second. And just the idea that uh, my first movie was The Jungle Book, as you mentioned earlier on, and uh, I had that record when I was a kid and I played it over and over and over again, obviously, loving all those songs. And the idea that decades later, you know, that composer would actually write music and a song for my film is just about as crazy as it gets in, a, in the most wonderful way. So, uh, yeah, I, I tell friends, life has a way sometimes to come full circle, to connect you with people who I guess need to be working together. And it was just a blast working with Richard. Well, that's the ultimate and the bare necessities at this point. No kidding. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, again, I wanna be like you, trust in me, you know, all those incredible songs from the Jungle Book. And they're, they're, they are, those songs are even more iconic in Germany, you know, where I grew up because uh, I keep telling people when I talk about the, the Jungle Book, um, most people don't know, but to this day, to today, the that version of the Jungle Book, the original 1967 Walt Disney film, is still the most visited uh, motion picture in German history. So forget about Avatar, Titanic, all the other blockbusters. It's that film that more people have seen over the years than any other film in history. So it has a special heart in uh, with the German people, of course, with me because I grew up in Germany, and um, yeah, uh, again, uh, to to find myself in a situation where I work with 
Richard Sherman, who, whose name I saw in the end credit, or the actually the credits in those days were before the film. And he just wrote this amazing lullaby for my film. And we, we actually used it not just as a song, but also as piece of the scoring. So that theme is repeatedly used uh, in slow moments and faster paced moments because it just applies to so many different situations. And uh, yeah, so, so lucky, still pinching myself. And how did the title of Mushka come about and the story itself? Well, that was a while ago, quite a few years ago. I uh, I knew I wanted to continue with the, this thing called hand-drawn animation because that's just my thing. You know, that's just who I am. And the wheels are still going and I still want to do this. And uh, so uh, then you realize you have to create your own project, you know. Projects really aren't handed over to you anymore or weren't. And so I um, got together with a friend, a couple of friends actually, to craft this story and i said the only thing i told him i said i want to do a film um an animal human relationship uh because i always loved those those kinds of stories when i was a kid and um let's just pair a young girl with a tiger and uh and see what happens and i had some rough ideas you know where this could go but kind of just the middle part of the film i could think of i didn't, didn't really have a beginning or an end and then that's when you reach out for people who have experience in, with, with storytelling and who can who could take my idea and flesh it out and that's what happened uh, and we ended up with a film that i thought would be maybe 10 12 minutes long but it's 28 and a half uh but i, I couldn't be more proud of it uh it was a long journey but um i loved every every minute of it people ask me how can you stay excited you know and work on a film for such a long time and i don't have an answer for that it's just what i do you get up in the morning, you have your coffee, and then you look at the storyboard and you say, well, that needs to be animated because I need to find out about that character. Next week, I'm going to be doing that section over there. You know, There's always work to do, and uh, and uh, motivation was never really an really issue because I love what I do. I always have, whether it was at Disney, on, on the Aladdin, Lion King, Beauty and the Beast, Lilo and Stitch. I loved all of them, and I love this because it's a new chapter for me because uh, here I had to kind of prove myself not just as an animator, who is an actor, basically, as you know, an actor with a pencil. You are responsible at Disney just for one character, or at least in those days. But now you got this big thing called storytelling and, uh, you know, working with art director or with an, with an art director, working with a mu musicians, right? with orchestra, working with sound people, Skywalker people. I mean, it was it was just this gigantic adventure. And... Um, but we, we pulled it off. It's done, and I'm super proud of it. And through all that, from a child watching this animated feature to becoming a Disney legend and working with Richard Sherman, uh, you know, it has to be a surreal life. I mean, you live this immigrant life, Polish background in Germany, and the Poles and Germans don't necessarily get along with each other. And if you watch the World Cup, they definitely don't get along with each other. <laughs> you know, so uh, like a triple immigration at this point from Poland to Germany, Germany to the United States. And, you know, I, what would you tell that 10 year old today that wrote the letter to Disney and, you know, 13 years after that, you end up working for them? I would just tell that 10 year old kid, fasten your seatbelt because you have no idea what's coming and uh, uh, keep your passion and, and follow it every step of the way. And um, and go for it because that that's in essence what really happened. Uh, when you are so, I tell you about something funny. Uh, when I was in at school at the time, ten eleven, uh, of course we had art at school, and my art teacher told me after I announced, when I'm older, when I'm grown up, I I want to get, I want to become an animator because that's I'm just fascinated by. It moving drawings, you know, and, you know, bring, bringing things to life. And he said, oh, animation, this is my art teacher, animation. He said, well, let me tell you, if you want to get into a field like that, it's going to be tough because there'll be competition and, and many people want to get into this kind of field. And uh, he said, animation would have to be the most important thing in your life if that's what you want to get into. And those words really scared me when I was a kid because they're big words, you know, the most important thing in your life. I've, but for all these decades later, thinking back who I was way back, 
it already had been the most important thing in my life. I just didn't know it yet. I was so, uh, especially after watching Jungle Book uh, and followed by the Aristocats and Robin Hood, the rescuers, and then the classics, Bambi, Lady and the Tramp, because they, they re-released them every few years in movie theaters in those days. And uh, so my, my, my passion just grew. And uh, yes, the idea of going to America and working at Walt Disney Studios, drawing cartoons seemed outrageously impossible. But there was that 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 that, that drive and uh, where where it just that just gets you places. So you write a letter, you get advice, you go to art school because that's what they told you to. You need to go to art school and learn how to draw really well, not cartoon characters, but real things, real people, animals, anatomy, and that just all made sense to me. And uh, it also became a lot of fun to do that. Uh, I di I I didn't go to the zoo to the zoos all over Germany because they told me I had to. Of course I did it because they advised me to do that, but it, it just became fun. I love going there. I love drawing elephants and giraffes and monkeys and zebras. And also the idea that you see yourself getting better. You know, you look at your sketchbooks from half a year ago and you go like, oh my goodness, look at that. I, I'm, I'm like so much better now. So the whole thing about seeing yourself getting better and, uh, 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 Hopefully, uh, I always thought hopefully it'll be good enough for a portfolio to enter Walt Disney Studios at one point, and uh, apparently it was. But it took it took hard work and a lot of passion and drive, and uh, but um, I had I had a lot of fun along that uh, journey. Uh, I just loved getting better at drawing. I loved uh, com well, I didn't love comparing myself to the Disney standard because that always seemed to unattainable. Because I. I knew, even as a teenager, how good these artists were, how well they could draw, and of course, what amazing animators that they were, the, the world's best, really. So, so who am I? But there was also this little voice that told me, "If you don't try, you'll never know." So, just go ahead and try, and uh, and that in the end, and got me a uh, at first not a job, but a a spot in the uh, training program that they had uh, opened up in the 1970s. And that training program was headed up by Eric Larson, one of the great animators, you know, from the past. And uh, so it, it was a time where they were thinking about training younger people in this craft. And so it was a trial period that lasted about six weeks. And then they see how you do. And I passed and they were happy with what I had done in terms of test animation during those six weeks. And then they hired me full time and that then turned into 30 years. And now here we are, you're still hand drawing. Mushka comes about. How did you pick the name to begin with? I mean, it, it is a very, you know, Eastern European name. And yes. you know, what was the catalyst for the name? Is it, you know, your grandmother was was named that or something or, you know? You know what, I think my screenwriter came up with it, come to think of it. Because um, Mushka, uh, you, you might know this, uh, is a word of endearment, a Russian word. It means sweetheart. Uh, I understand if you, Translated directly, it means little fly, but parents or grandparents use it for their grandchild child, saying, oh, my little mushka, my little sweetheart, you know? And so it, it just stuck. Um, I think my my screenwriter, Michael McKinney, just Googled that and found out about it. And then I thought, well, what if I use that symbolically and graphically, this, this letter M, you know, and make that a part of the storytelling as a birthmark on the tiger's body. And then when she got called Mushka because of this M birthmark. So it became an integral part of the story and it just kind of stuck. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, you mentioned the Sherman brothers and how they wrote It's a Small World. And you're multilingual yourself. Uh, will there be, um, you know, German and Polish and, and various other Slavic translations of the songs and of the animated feature as we go along, or feature. I said, yeah, I certainly hope so. That's the plan uh, to um, you know have it understood worldwide and and hopefully appreciated worldwide in in as many languages as possible. Uh, we don't have we have one song. We don't have a lot of dialogue in the film because we try to tell the story mostly in pantomime. But of course, there are words spoken and conversations to be had that would have to be translated. So, uh, yes, that's the plan to to have it in, in as many languages as possible. Yeah, as this is interesting because as long as you've worked with animation, this is considered your directorial debut. 
Uh, it's another notch in the belt for you of being a creative. What's it like going from character design to now being the head guy? Well, uh, I did some character designs, as you mentioned at Disney, but I'm mostly known for being one of the supervising animators, you know, so I was responsible, not just for a look of the character, but also for the acting, the animation, you know, all the way going back to King Triton or Jafar, Gaston, and, you know, Hercules, all of them, Scar. Uh, that's my responsibility. So I really become the actor for that particular character. It, those are my choices, really. And But what most people don't know, if the studio had cast another animator, just a different artist on Scar or on Jafar, that character would end up looking and moving very differently because we throw our own personality, our own um, sense of acting, the way we feel about the character. It's a very personal statement. So another artist would have done this well, for sure, but differently, very differently. You know, so that's who you are at Disney, you know, as a supervising animator, you're an actor, you know, with your pencil. Now being a director, well, you're kind of <laughs> head of the whole thing. You know, the first thing on your mind is like, you cannot get started unless you have a story and hopefully a good one. And so um, I knew my shortcomings. I, I had this idea that I mentioned earlier on. I really wanted to do something with animals because I, I love drawing animals. I'm passionate about uh, wildlife and always have. And uh, so it had to have an animal in it. Tigers are one of my favorite animals. So um, I started right there. And um, But then, of course, it grows. Then you have to storyboard it. And at Disney, I never storyboard it either. I always found that very challenging because you're more of a comic book, comic strip artist. You know, you you kind of draw the story panel by panel by panel by panel. And acting at that moment when you storyboard is not really that important yet. You really think about the story continuity and the camera angles and how it cuts. Are you gonna have a close up? Are you gonna have a medium shot, a long shot? Where's the camera? Is it an up shot or a down shot? You know, so those filmmaking techniques are really what you think about at first and making sure that the story is fluid, that the character change, because if the character is, is, is the same throughout the film, it's, it's, it's boring, you know? So um, the, the relationship between the characters need to be interesting and hopefully also change. All of that, uh, even though I knew how, that, how people did that at Disney, but to me personally, it was new. And, uh, and at first, a little, a little scary, I'm not going to lie. Uh, but then you just, just jump in and you just do it, you know, and you surround yourself. Yeah, that's, I think, one thing that was really important. You surround yourself with people who you value, whose artistic talent and artistic judgment you value. And they will tell you if this is nonsense, what you just came up with, or if this is great, or or, or it needs to be reworked. People will actually tell you that. So I, I ran this by... Uh, my team and even people from out, outside of my team uh, often. And then you get feedback and you sense, you know, how these things, how these ideas are coming across. And then we had the whole thing storyboarded and then it was time to animate it, just the old fashioned way on paper uh, on an old Disney animation desk, which I have in my home studio here from the late 1930s, a uh, uh, very sentimental piece of furniture and great to work on. And so once the animation was done, on paper, then we scan all the drawings uh, into a program, and then you add your character colors, your camera moves, <clears throat> and the background, of course. The backgrounds were painted by an artist called Natalie Franschioni Carp. She painted really the majority of the backgrounds herself, I would say about 80%, and that's an enormous amount of backgrounds for an almost half, an, half hour film. But she stuck with me through the years, and. Uh, um, she got the style down 100%, just the way I envisioned it even better. And so she painted her, her background digitally on the Cintiq. But I said, Natalie, that, that's fine if that's your preferred medium to do it digitally, but make them look like they're like a watercolor sketch. You know, the end result should look like they could have been, this image, this environment could have been painted on watercolor paper. And she did. Uh, so I keep that handcrafted look for the characters and for the backgrounds, and uh, I think I think we actually achieved that. 
And how were you able to find Holly to be the vocalist for this? And uh, Cedillo or Cedillos? How do I pronounce her name properly? Cedillo. The, the L becomes a, a sort of, a, 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 yeah, soft. So we say Cedillos. <clears throat> and um, yeah, I've been looking for, for a singer and hadn't been successful. And uh, also Richard's Lullaby is a challenging song to sing. There are a lot of high notes there that people, singers with a middle range, um, maybe couldn't do, because you have to have really a big range to pull that off. And then uh, the composer uh, of my film, Fabrizio Mancinelli, he had been a friend of Richard Sherman's, and uh, he knew that I was struggling finding a singer. And he said, well, I just came across Holly, say, Dio's go on YouTube, and she's got a few things posted there, and uh, she's a trained opera singer. But she's also done musicals and then one thing leads to the next and holly it was you know and we recorded her and she just turned out to be perfect for this and it it is poignant the you know the film takes place in ukraine and it wasn't intended with a political agenda because you've you've were working on this for quite a while and then we have to deal with the situation going on between two sibling countries between russia and ukraine like when it comes time to release this, like, is there that tension of do people think we're picking sides at this point? Or is it, no, the story is just about a girl and her cub that just happens to take place in Ukraine? I think it's the latter. It's a completely unpolitical, non-political story. Uh, we were actually thinking originally about India, naturally, because you think tiger, girl, India, that's where the tigers are, right? And so my screenwriter, Micah, started out developing this, Indian village and the girl who lives there and you know how she, she finds this cub this abandoned cub and then he called me after a couple of weeks of writing and said I just I just don't think it's fresh enough or I, I don't remember how he exactly worded it but he wasn't too happy with what he was doing and he said it just seems so familiar with the jungle book already being a famous Indian uh, story out of India with Shere Khan and the boy Mowgli and so he was frustrated with it and then it was my idea when I said, well, wait a minute, we don't have to have it in India. The biggest tigers in the world are in Siberia. Let's go there. And again, mind you, this is more than 10 years ago when we were having these talks, 11 years ago, probably. And, uh, and I thought, well, then it'll be a tiger in the snow. And it'll be about cold weather and harsh uh, surroundings. Let's just take, take it there. And so that, that's how that happened. Yeah, because that's the fascinating part is when art somehow imitates life or becomes a, a part of life that was unintentional, especially with, you know, the world stage being where we are right now. Yeah, uh, it is what it is, you know, but we started our movie, like uh, I mentioned, so so early. And uh, when when you watch your people who will see it, it has, it has nothing to do with uh, politics. It's uh, it's really a side note, the, the locations that we picked. Uh, it it's really is it's about... The, the story about a girl raising a tiger and their friendship and the hardship that comes with when they realize she can't really keep him forever. She can't, you know? So that's the, that's the heart of the story. Um, nearly 30 minutes and it's taken a while because you had to get everything right and hand-drawn animation is not easy to, co to complete. Uh, what is the drive to still do everything by hand for you? Is it just embedded in who you are from such an early age or is it you know i don't want to change with the times type thing no you just follow your gut i always have you know uh against all odds uh i made that big journey that big leap from a small little town just south of the dutch border you know all the way to hollywood and had a career at disney studios because i followed my gut if i hadn't i was still be in Germany and there's nothing wrong with that either I love I love going back to Germany and I I love living there but if I wanted to be a part of uh, that kind of filmmaking they were the best you know there was some animation going on in London especially for commercials animated 2D commercials that was my plan B by the way to go to London if Disney hadn't worked out but it did work out because I did follow my gut and I'm following my gut again it's like I'm not done with it yet because I love it so much. You know, there's still stories to be told and worlds to explore. And, uh, um, you know, CG animation is wonderful. And uh, 
I happily leave that for other folks to uh, to do and make that their medium. But uh, I um, I'm just a big uh, fan of art and drawing and uh, having art on the screen, having seen the artist hand prints basically on the screen. That's just who I am, and that's what that's what I want to see. I want to. I want to see personal artistic statements, and I, the only way I can do that is by by drawing, which I love to do anyway. And where are we going to be able to find Mushka? Is it going to be on a film festival circuit? Is it going to be VOD? You know, wh where are we going to be able to find the the uh, featurette? We've done a whole year plus of uh, festivals, traveled all all over the world last year. Some some also this year. So we have done that. We we won some wonderful awards. And we just started knocking on uh, uh, the door of some company streamers to offer it. And, uh, hopefully, it'll it'll land somewhere soon. It's 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 looking good. So that that news will come when we get there, since we 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 just started offering. Well, this is also very much a proof of concept. Is there hope of turning it into a full length, ninety plus minute feature as well, or is this just the standalone story of? 28 minute runtime. This is the amount of time that we needed to tell you this story. Uh, it's funny. You're, you're not the, the only one who asked me this story. It's, even people who've seen it say, you know, this could be a feature. And my eyes just go, heaven forbid. Uh, uh, I, I, in theory, I could stretch it into a feature 90 minutes or 80 minutes. But uh, I think the story holds as it is. I wouldn't mind doing a few children's books. The, the further adventures of Sarah and Mushka, you know, exploring their world, uh, uh, you know, uh, just in, in book illustration form. Uh, and I might do that because I'm, I sort of have certain things in mind that I want to explore that I didn't in the film. But I think as a piece of storytelling, uh, that, that format for this story holds up. And uh, uh, I think it, it, it will, I don't think it needs to be stretched into a feature film. I would rather jump onto our next project, which I already have, slowly working on my next short film, um, which will be completely different than Mushka. Um, so that's the thing, you want to shift gears. Uh, you know, you want to, just like I did with Disney, I, I did villains, but then I also did an innocent character like Lilo and a hero like Hercules, and I was able to do these different character concepts. And uh, I feel that way about short filmmaking. You want to, the next one is going to be all comedy, all dialogue, completely different than, than Mushka. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I just started to dive into that one, and uh, we'll see how long that'll take me. It won't be half an hour, by the way. I'm, I'm just looking more of a seven-minute type film. Could these end up being part of an anthology series? Yeah, if you want to wait that long, because uh, this one also will take a while to make even a seven-minute film, because I, uh, I will always end up having a small crew, because uh, I found out that people who... And well, this one, this, this next one will be even more personal than Mushka. So I, I think I have to animate the whole thing, actually, come to think of it. Um, but it, but it's doable. Seven minutes all animating it yourself is uh, doable. And, and then I have ideas beyond that. Uh, so if you wait long enough, there'll be a Blu-ray special edition with a collection of Andreas Data short films. That just might happen. <laughs> Well, I'm hoping for that because your work has been incredible. I mean, you have your Disney legend status. You've been inducted as a Disney legend, uh, considered one of the old, what, uh, what was it? The nine old men was the official title? Well, the nine old men were actually, uh, that was a term that Walt Disney used for his animators. Mm -hmm. uh, and these are the ones that taught me. So uh, there were about nine new young men, probably more than nine, uh, that uh, created Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King, Pocahontas, and all of those, you know. But uh, yeah, I'm part of the next generation. Yeah, but you were still taught by the previous generation. Yes. yes. And it's interesting to see how things have evolved story wise, how, you know, the CG stuff has taken over. Inside Out 2 just came out. Um, you know, Soul had c come out during the pandemic and so on and so forth. But it's so, there's still a wonder into the 2D animation that I think doesn't get the recognition that it could rightly deserve today. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, when I, when, when I go to uh, art schools and I give talks about my work and my Disney career or, or I show my short film, uh, people are still in love with this art, want to learn it. And far from me to say, 
no, don't do it because you know most of the the jobs are in CG. Uh, you never you never know where the industry is going to go. It'll just take one big two D box office smash that comes from somewhere, maybe from Europe, you know, and everybody will wake up and say, wait a minute, there's still a, a world audience for this. Uh, when I started at Disney, uh, animation, of course, at that time, 2D animation was almost going to be gone then. And uh, it was just because of the family, really, Roy Disney uh, said, uh, we, we can't give this up. This is the heart and soul of the company. So let's give this a good shot. And uh, if you find a, an enthusiastic, group of people who feel passionate about the future and the possibilities of this art form, there's no reason why it can't come back. Is there also this intrigue on your part where what's recognized as the first full-length animated feature coming from Germany, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, to being a Polish immigrant to Germany and falling in love with animation in Germany and then migrating to the United States to work for the biggest animation company in the world. Like, is there that interesting line of connection for you? Or is this just something that I'm trying to string together? Well, I mean, I was aware. I don't think I'd seen uh, The Adventures of Prince Ahmed until many years later. By the way, that movie is going to be 100 years old in two years, I believe. Uh, somebody from Germany just emailed me this afternoon about that fact. And they're uh, planning a restoration, a celebration in uh, Europe, you know, because of it. Uh, so, yeah, there is definitely a heritage uh, in Germany. Um, there was um, an animation studio called Fischer Kösen, who had done before World War II some really wonderful short film. They were trying to compete with Disney. They didn't quite get there, well, because they didn't have Walt, basically. But they did some beautiful short films, commercial films, and then World War II, of course, uh, uh, kind of made it stop that whole endeavor. Um, so who knows what would have happened in Germany in terms of animation. And had there been a, in industry, had there not been World War II, I probably would be there. But it is what it is. And uh, uh, me falling just head over heels in love with the uh, Disney style, with the Disney type of storytelling, uh, that's the way it went. And uh, I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunity I had uh, to come to the States and uh, being welcomed here by everybody, really, and uh, having had this amazing career. Well, if it wasn't for that uh, story of coming to the United States and you being here and part of the animation, you would have not influenced my childhood in the love of these animated features. And that makes me feel very good when people tell me that that my characters played a part in that childhood. I. Uh, I I uh, have to be careful not to tear up when I hear words like that, to be honest with you. Yeah, I mean, I just reviewed the play Beauty and the Beast. It was a local production, and there's going to be a bigger production coming as well. And they're using your design of Gaston as the, Gas as the Gaston uniform and, and outfit. Have you seen a live production where they've brought Gaston into you know, the real world? I have. Uh, it was, one, I believe, one of the first that Disney did to put Beauty and the Beast on stage. And I, I saw it on Broadway and it opened there. Uh, I remember the actor who played Gaston was Burke Moses and he, he was a great Gaston and several other followed. I've seen the production even in Europe, in France and other places. And uh, I was just in Europe uh, a couple of weeks ago and I, in Hamburg, and uh, I stopped by to see Hercules, uh, which had the world premiere in Hamburg, in Germany, I mean, not on Broadway, so I saw that and saw my character basically on stage in real life, you know, uh, uh, with all these Alan Menken songs. It was fantastic. And and then uh, but I also stopped by in a different part of town. They were still playing The Lion King. That had never stopped in uh, Germany. And, and I, I met up with the actor after the performance who played Scar. And he explained to me all the mechanics that were used in this complicated scar costume you know and and it, it was just fascinating so it's just uh yeah it is absolutely fascinating to see how how when something hits big in popular culture it goes beyond a movie you know it it finds other uh outlets whether it's the stage or whether it's uh unique merchandise or ice shows uh, who knows but uh i have to say that lion king is one of my favorite uh stage musicals i've seen that show 
many times in different countries and um it, it is uh it is unparalleled i think in terms of presentation and uh what they did with our film it's out of this world i think have you ever teased the actors and say i designed the original character to be taller ha! uh no but i tell you what i did do when i was so excited about uh, the lion king opening on broadway all those years ago and uh, even though before that before i got excited about it i was sort of negative about it because i couldn't see the vision that humans could play lions and animals i i couldn't see it once I did see a preview of how that would all work, then I got completely fascinated by it and I loved it. And before it officially opened, I went around the studio to every supervising animator from The Lion King. So to the person who did Simba, the person who did Nala, or Rafiki. Uh, and I said, well, why don't we all do a character sketch and inscribe it to, uh, uh, for the person, for the actor who's doing it on Broadway. So they have a, a, a a memento from us, from from the animated film to the stage. So uh, they actually handed those out during the premiere after the first showing of the film. Everybody got got their character sketch from us. So I I really enjoyed doing that, and uh, it made them feel good. You know, it's uh, just a, a shot in the arm for them. It's like now now it's yours. You know, do do your thing with with our characters and our story. Before I let you go, Andreas, I want to ask when we can finally find Mushka, you know, whether it be a, through a streaming service or on, on Blu-ray, um, what's the one takeaway you want us to get from the story? Because all the work that you've worked on in the past has invoked, you know, either great memories or, you know, touched us in so many different ways. What's the one thing that you want us to, to sit there and have it touch our soul as the core of the story of Mushka? Well, I think the most important thing is probably the idea that this medium is not old fashioned. It is not outdated. You can still be uh, entertained and dive into a story that is being told through drawings and, and artwork uh, that is completely handmade, completely made up. And uh, yeah, the idea that that drawings become alive, not just move, but also tell you a story and you believe that they're real, they're drawings, but they're also real, which is sort of a magic trick um, that is that is unique. Uh, so in in other words, it still can be done. It's not over yet, you know, uh, that that uh, it's still a, a fascinating art form um, that can en entertain and, and and be enjoyed by everybody. The other thing I want to point out is, and this has to do with students, uh, that this was a, a huge effort on my little crew to get this thing done. But if you have um, an idea and you want to turn that into a film, it doesn't have to be a half hour film. It just can be a minute or two minutes long. But there is nothing from keeping you to do that, but your creativity, you know. Uh, it's not that, that expensive to do a two, three minute film. Uh, you know, just uh, surround yourself with like-minded people and uh, and just go for it. The costs are relatively low, uh, maybe even none, if you find people who want to contribute their time and have co-ownership of, of the film. So just as a stimulus, like if you have an idea, uh, there's nothing holding you back. You don't have the costs of having a print of a 35 millimeter film, which was huge in the old days. Your film, is a little file. That's your film, you know, and uh, uh, it, it almost costs nothing. Um, and uh, yeah, if you have a vision, if you have an idea, just run with it. You're going to have a great time. I love it. Uh, Andreas Deja, where can we find you on social media if we want to connect with you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram. Uh, you can, I have a blog that I started many, many years ago. Uh, which is a little overdue. I'm I'm overdue to do a new post. It's been a few weeks, but I try to have a, a weekly update on my blog called Deja View. Um, I'm on Facebook, a little bit on Twitter or X. Uh, so on all, on most of the platforms, you can find me. Fantastic, Andreas Deja. The film is Mushka. The website is mushkathemovie.com congratulations on everything you've ever accomplished in life will you be at d23 this year by the way yeah 
The answer is yes, and I'm really looking at it. Well, hopefully we'll get our press approval this year, and I will see you at D23, and we'll grab a cup of coffee together. Sounds fantastic. Thank you so much.